Football League, Hertfordshire League, will get half the season in. They'll play nine games rather than everybody home and away. And I don't think there'll be relegation and promotion, but at least it'll be half the season nonetheless. And I'm glad, yeah. really glad that's happening for not just the ECB, because they're, they're kind of paid to do these things, but up and down the land, the volunteers, thousands of volunteers that put in the work to clubs. Um, you know, it's a, it's a reward for their hard work as well. Mm. So I'm glad that happened today. It was a bit yeah. of a U-turn from the government today. And I have to say, everything the government's done for the last four months, um, I have a certain sympathy for, i.e. the complications involved in a very, very unprecedented situation. Um, there are times we've all gone, oh, for heaven's sake, why or why not? Um, I have a very good friend of mine, a fellow called Roger Morgan Grenfell, who runs a team called the White Hunters Cricket Club. They're an itinerant bunch of no-hopers. And uh, fittingly, I am their president. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> But he wrote, in, in his frustration at Boris's vector of disease about the ball, he wrote a very good hard-hitting blog a week ago, which I put on Twitter. Um, but he'll be delighted that he can lead his merry men um, back on the field at some stage very soon. And of course, the, I mean, the thing about all this, surely, is that this time last year, we were fating a World Cup win. We were fating another Ashes series, which although England didn't win it or didn't get the Ashes back, it was a well-fought and brilliant series. And everyone was lifted by the game. Of course, no cricket means that no one can play. And if you're, whether, you, whether, you're watching, whether you're watching or not watching, as it were, test cricket, or whether you're trying to play your own game, what, what was needed, of course, for people to get out on the field, enjoy the feeling of playing the game, you know, get their own feeling of um, how much fun you can have playing cricket and build on it, whether you're the White Hunters or whether you're a First Division League club around the country, or whether, of course, you're England's cricketers. So... Uh, let's all say, let's give a you know, big round of applause for everyone getting very well, closer and closer yet to cricket starting again, albeit, where are we now? July, yes, middle of the summer. Um, right, well, let's about, let's put, I think there are hmm. about 6,500 clubs across the country, and then yeah. a few more, like, as you say, itinerant clubs, mm -hmm. and you're looking at at least a quarter of a million regular players who play two or three times a month, and probably three times that who play occasionally. So it's it's not an inconsiderable number, and I think the game wasn't getting a fair, um, a fair it wouldn't have got a fair deal had it been held to different account than say tennis or whatever. So I'm glad uh, I'm glad they've come round. Uh, Mike, I know you've got to go. You're a very busy man, of course. But at some stage, there are a couple of questions here. Uh, one from an old friend of ours, Roger Dakin, um, goes back to something earlier in the conversation, talking about the dressing room. How did you find going into an England dressing room for the first time? Were you welcomed or was it daunting? And Mike, I know exactly what your answer is going to be. <laughs> well, g given that you were the captain, David, I have yep. to say that it was extremely welcoming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you, you know um, the truth too. You know the truth. It was the mid <laughs> or towards the end of a very frazzled series. It, was, it was the end of a very frazzled series, 1989. I was probably about the 27th or 28th player that you picked that summer. The Rebel tourists had just signed to go to South Africa. Everything was in meltdown. Uh, but I do remember walking into that dressing room at Trent Bridge and Beefy was there and you were there. All these players, I mean, bizarrely, really, when you think about it, players that you watch when I was 9, 10, 11, and suddenly you're in the same changing room. Um, and it's a very odd feeling, but I have to say, um, I wasn't overawed. I was delighted to be there, but I, I was made to feel welcome too. So I'm always grateful for that. And the codicil to that particular tale is that on day one, which hadn't exactly gone well, <laughs> um, so your first day of test cricket, you might have been well, a little surprised uh, to be handed the ball and say, have a go at this. Yeah, I, I never can remember whether it was the first day or the second day, actually. I think it might have been the second day that you handed me the ball because hmm. the first day, as you will remember, Australia were 301 for none. That was my first day in Test cricket. It was Devon Malcolm's first day as well. We yeah. did not take a wicket all day. Um, and my last day of Test cricket against Australia, we got beat by an innings. And I like to tell people that it didn't get much better <laughs> in between those two days yeah. either, think, particularly against Australia. You remember, <laughs> you're right, that, that second day at, at uh, Trent Bridge, uh, it's one of my favourite little stories against myself, is... We got a wicket on the second morning and at lunch. So which, whichever one of Marshall Taylor you know, finally made a mistake, we had, we had one in the bag by lunchtime on day two. When we walked into lunch at the at Trent Bridge in the pavilion there, which is a very compact area with both teams squashed together, 
I stood up amongst them all, the Australians already sitting down, tucking in, and shouted, or well, not shouted, said very loudly to the ladies serving lunch, ladies, we need champagne. <laughs> Please bring us champagne. We have taken a wicket, we need to celebrate. And <laughs> of course, all the Aussies going, what's going on, mate? They've only, only got one bloody wicket, mate. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's day two, we've already won the series. And, and glad, actually, um, talking of debuts or talking of first days, um, you then played in the next game, Glad, didn't you? I did, at the Oval. Mm. I, was, I was brought in for when the series was obviously already done. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, yes, I was called up for that. But that was the sixth, was that the sixth test match yeah. of, the, of that series? Yeah. It felt like um, about the tenth. Uh, yeah. So, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I think I was brought in for my batting because you two obviously hadn't scored any runs. That's That's right. I remember going in, going in and to, had to go in to try and save the follow on on, a, <laughs> a, on day three, on day three of that test match. Yeah, well, hang on. Can I, say, <laughs> can I say a big thank you to Gladys? Because on the first morning of that game at the Oval, um, Gladstone Small and Alan Eggleston, Iggy, who was, had a big build up to his, his debut test match, um, because we had all sorts of injuries, apart from selection problems, we had all sorts of injuries. but. Gladys, I gave you the ball for about 13 overs on the trot. Um, where it, again, would have felt like that to you because you were bowling so well. And I thought, I, yeah, I don't care if I completely <laughs> bowl him into the ground here. You know, this is, this is what we have to do. the last test of the summer. So you yeah. <laughs> yeah, have you have six well. months off. <laughs> it was a great I mean, it was a bit of a night. I mean, I've known one. The guys I'd known in the Australian team, I'd played quite a bit of cricket in, in Melbourne with mm. the, the big bearded, hairy brook that we had on this, this chat a few weeks ago, Merv, Merv Hughes. And, it, and he, you know, it, it was, you know he, he was full of, full of that, you know, as he normally would be Merv. And there was you know, lots of welcomes and, and all that sort of stuff. And every time, he, every time he, he, he pitched the ball up to me, the one shot I had was a cover drive. So one shot I could play was a cover drive. So, so I would drive him. And because I knew, I knew his style of bowling, when he was going to bowl a bouncer, his, his run-up, which was always quite staccato in style anyway, got even more, more stuttering. So, they, so I knew the boxer was coming like, when he was like 20 yards away from the crease. So I would, I would start to duck. And I would duck under the ball and Kevin and I would, I would blow him a kiss. And that, that <laughs> totally infuriated Mervyn. You get me like, I got called even more names that day than, than, than Mervyn normally would. Okay, now um, I can see Phil Simmons is ready and waiting to join in. Phil, very good evening to you. Uh, we'll be good talking evening. to you in a moment or two. I uh, hope you like the background. Uh, my character. Uh, uh, well, I can change it to Hampshire if you like. Hang on, I'll do that in a moment. Uh, Phil, right within a moment, Zach Crawley is also going to be with us as well. Uh, Mike, uh, thank you very much for your time. Before you go, um, one of the questions. I'm still waiting to be answered from Rob Kelly is who do you think will be England's first choice spinner? And he does say any chance for debut from that they'll Parkinson. stick with Don Beck. Um, I think in the end they will look back to where they were before this pandemic hit. When was the last time they played? It was January in South Africa, wasn't it? A test match so long ago. Uh, but because there's been nothing happening since then, I think something special would have to happen in order to knock the man in possession out of his place when England had beaten South Africa. So I think they'll probably stick with Don Best. Not so sure, because obviously Moe Nally's back in the mix. Jack Leach is fit again. I don't think Matt Parkinson will, will get picked. Um, so I think probably best, but who knows? Yeah. Um, Mike, thank you very much indeed. Uh, very, very right, good to see you. Great course. to see you. Good to um, see you, Phil. Can uh, I say, Mike, 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 before you go, um, please pass on my <laughs> fondest regards to all those left at Sky. Um, I will still, do. Can I, can I say it's a weird thing because, I mean, it's very obvious to me and probably to you that I'd love to be there uh, in the role that was such good fun for the last 20 years. But at the same time, <laughs> I'm, I, as you said earlier, I'm a bit concerned about the complete lack of atmosphere yeah, it's, 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 in the ground. So good luck, be, good luck with that. Tricky, but I'm sure Phil's men in England will put on a show for us, so give us something to commentate on. Anyway, good to see you all. Right. Simo, Thank very you. good evening to you. Um, I'm uh, good, I'm good. Uh, I'm just going to do something for you here. Um, 
because obviously I, I didn't want to make you too jealous with that Caribbean background. Um, uh, you can take your pick. Would you like these? <laughs> or this bucolic scene from Hampshire. So this is just you know, around the back here. I'll take, I'll take the Hampshire. Okay, I'll, I'll, or, we can, or we can have this darkened room. Um, Phil, how's it going in the camp at the moment? Things have been good. Things have been good. We've been isolated, if you, for want of a better word, in, in Old Trafford. Um, yep. Can't think of much better places to be training and, and, and practicing and just walking back to your room. Um, and it's been good. We've been together and, and working hard. So I think that's the important thing here. Um, but how, how's it been? Because this isolation, this lockdown, um, you can't go out. You're, you can't go out of your rooms hardly. Uh, hardly. Um, you know, it's a very, very unnatural situation for, for anyone. And especially for you know, touring Caribbean cricketers. We all remember, you, know, you remember the days, I remember the days beforehand. Um, let's face it, you know, part of the fun of touring was going to different places, was getting out and about, was um, obviously a bit of social work in the local community, that sort of thing, if I can put it that way. Um, and of course, this whole next month is going to be without all that. Well, I think there was a lot of practice um, beforehand because especially in the Caribbean, things were locked down for a few months. Um, only the last week before we came here that some of the different countries open for guys to go out and play and practice and things like that. So there's been a lot of practice with it. I think now it's a lot better because at least when we were home for that first part of, of the lockdown, there was nothing you could do. At least now you're going out and you're practicing and you're, you're, you're running and you're going to gym and you're doing things that you love doing. So I think it's, it's improved from the first three months of the, uh, the lockdown. Well, hang on there for a moment. I see that Zach has joined us, uh, Zach Crawley. Um, again, as a Black Opal ambassador, Lord Taverns ambassador as well. Zach, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. How are you? Um, well, the hair's still growing. Uh, yeah, depending on the background, you know, it's either out here somewhere or in here somewhere, but we're, we're still coping. Um, how, how have you been? How's this game gone the last two or three days for you? No, it's been great to uh, finally get some cricket in. It's been the longest I've been without a game of cricket, I reckon, since I was about 10. So um, it was nice to get out there. It actually wasn't too strange, to be honest. I was expecting it to be really strange and everyone to be a bit, um, to be a bit awkward around it. But no, it was great to get out there and um, it felt pretty normal, to be honest. And, you know, I've, I've played in front of no crowds um, quite a bit in my life, so it won't affect me much. Uh, yeah. It might affect some of, the, some of the bigger players a bit more. Well, yeah, you never know, you never know. I mean, are you thinking, I mean, is the theory that once you actually get to a game, are you a test match, that even without the crowd, even without you know, the pop-up Black Oval supporters dotted around the Aegeus Bowl, that the, the sheer element of competition will be enough to, to get you going? Absolutely, I agree with that completely. Maybe in the warm-up and, you know, after the game, maybe when the crowd's still there is when you most realise it. But from my experience, of, I was lucky to play in front of a good crowd in Cape Town. And, um, but like you say, once you were there playing each ball at a time, it felt like a, an, any normal game where you're, you're concentrating so much that you're kind of just concentrating on the battle with the bowl, really. So, um, so I, I definitely agree. I don't think once the first ball's bowled, I think it'll be back to normal and the cricket mm. won't suffer at all. And how's the battle going for, for places? It's good. I'm really enjoying it. I mean, um, throughout my whole career, there's been always a battle for places, you know, since mm. I've been first started playing cricket. And it's always made me a better player. So I'm, uh, I think it'd be good for the side and good for me personally to, uh, to have a good battle for places. There's a battle for places with the bowling lineup as well, which would be good. And so, you know, all the practice sessions and all the net sessions have been quite intense because obviously everyone wants to play for England. So, um, Mm. So I think it's going to be really good for the side that we've got this strength and depth. While I'm still on that topic, um, I hear you've joined us at the Lord's Taverners as an ambassador. So welcome as, as your president. Um, very warm welcome to the, the very famous ranks of the Lord's Taverners. But you're also <laughs> involved in this scheme, Runs for Change, yes. with Joe Denley. So Joe also an ambassador for both, uh, well, for Lord's Taverners as well. Uh, talk us through Runs for Change. Well, basically, it's the chance to sponsor myself and Joe on all the runs we score. It can be anything from, you know, a five-tier run to, to a pounder run or anything you like. And um, basically, all the, all the money raised, um, which you donate, will, will go to the Lord's Taverners. But um, 
I only got told about this yesterday, actually. So it was, it was news to me. It was, it was a big honour for sure. And um, big, I'm now even more of an incentive to score a few runs, hopefully. But um, but yeah, no, I'm really looking forward to hopefully getting a few runs. Is that, some is that runs in the test matches? Or runs in the test matches. Only, yeah, only, only for England. Well, that's a shame. Because if, if, one, if one of you's not playing, that I puts know. double pressure on maybe you. Who has to carry the drinks? Then you've got to get Joe's runs as well for the Lord's Taverners. I know, oh, exactly. Well, ideally, we'd both be in the side and raise double the money. So <laughs> both both score in hundreds. But um, but unfortunately, sometimes that might not be the case. So um, we'll have to wait and see. If he, if if I miss out and he plays, hopefully he scores a double sum. Yeah, fair enough. Um, Simo, back to you. Um, not too much of that double, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, we, are, we, of course, are neutral. Um, Simo, back to you. In terms of the, the way the squad is shaping up, um, what are your opinions? I mean, as a, you know, I'm a long way from the camp, as it were, but it looks, again, as though the bowling would be the strong suit or the stronger suit. Um, you've got some very fine bowlers there, some quick, sharp bowlers as well, just harking back in many ways to the great days of the Caribbean and Caribbean cricket. Um, how do you reckon the batting is going to shape up, though? I think over the last couple of weeks, the batting has, they've worked hard, the batters, on, on getting to a, 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 I think it's more of a mental stage as to where they need to be because they, most of them have scored runs here. Um, Hope yeah. has back-to-back hundreds, things like that. So it's more about getting to that mental stage where they, they, they are prepared for a test match and a test match in England, which is usually different to many other places. So... I think we are close as we as we can get to that now. The next three days of practice is, is about sharpening up that the, the skills and, and just preparing. As I say, mentally is the big thing yeah. over the next four days. I mean, when I asked the question, I hadn't forgotten heading lead last time round. And the guy's batting so well, mm-hmm. so confidently to win a test match there. And that sort of experience, of course, is one that the players themselves involved will not forget, and one they can always share. So from your point of view as a coach, you must be drawing on that sort of experience. Yeah, you're drawing on that. And I think that what we, what we try and, and work on is that the test match before, I think we were horrible, if I remember. Um, and we seem to be like that most times we, we go on tour. So we've been trying to, to make sure that that bad match has been taken out of the equation and we start properly. It's we're playing against one of the best test teams in the world right now, and we need to to start and and, and go to front rather than keep yeah. going back. Well, I, I remember having team meetings way back. Obviously, by definition, it is way back. <laughs> and in in certain circumstances, where we had that same thing, you know, a poor first test match, we used to say things like, "Okay, why don't we just pretend that this is the second test match that we're playing now, not the first? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's whatever it takes, isn't it, to get the right sort of front frame of mind going. Yeah, that's, that's what we've been trying to do. We've been trying to, as you say, bring back a lot of memories from, from Headingley. Yeah. Um, and and as, as you said before, the bowlers seem to be taking care of themselves for the last three years. Um, it's just to get the, the, psychologi- the psychology into these batsmen. And, and we will we'll be there. We'll be ready. And well, Simo, Simo I mean, obviously a lot of your squad, uh, most of, a lot of them would have played test cricket. Some of the guys have played county cricket in, in England, um, you know. So, so, but the one, the, the, the GS Graham, GS Ball in Southampton, not sure, not quite sure how many of the guys would have played there. But so we were talking earlier, the, the, the West Indies, you know, not, you, you normally get some really good support, as well as obviously support for England, but the West Indies played in England, they normally get some very good support. Is that going to be? Is that going to be obviously missed? And how will that affect your guys? Um, I think. I think um, maybe as Zach said earlier, it a lot of the senior guys and they won't like me calling them senior, but it might affect a few of them because they are accustomed to England. All Test matches are usually sold out, so they are accustomed to that. I think if you play a Test match in the Caribbean, it's not much crowd. So we are kind of accustomed to that, if you want to use that word, and. We, we, we're hoping that, that that doesn't affect us because I think, um, as you said before, once you get into the game, a lot of times you notice the crowd at 50 and at 100. 
when you are lifting your but if you're concentrating um, on the game, you don't really notice the crowd most of the you time. You see, you got three board, three batsmen here. Us boarders, we were down, we were normally on the boundary, you know. You, know, well, you had to fight with them. <laughs> in, the, you know, in the Caribbean, you get offered a, a tot of rum or a drum, of, a chicken leg or something to keep you going. Uh, talking of which, talking of which um, Simo, in honour of the West Indies, I have here a glass of rum. The ice is now melted. <laughs> it's one hell of a glass of rum, actually. Hang on a second. Oh, that brings back memories. Um, and actually, uh, <laughs> and Sim, I've got another question for you here. So, a question from or fulfilled from the Full Toss blog, James Morgan, the Full Toss blog. Um, Shea Hope, who was part of that partnership, that record breaking partnership at Heading the last time round, has got such a good record against England, but struggled against other nations. He always looks fantastic against us, i.e., England. Why do you think that is? I don't know. Yeah. You asked me that, so... Oh, feel free. You know, tell us the answer. Chat. Come back on. Tell us the answer. I'll tell you what he thinks. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, okay, anyone who's ever played the game knows that there are, for various reasons, you know, sides that you uh, sometimes just feel good against. Um, and, obviously, if you have had success before against a particular country, particular side, that's in the bank. It's up here in the memory bank. And you think, yes, um, I'm happy playing against these guys. And, I mean, for instance, I'm, I can think back to... Uh, again, going back to my, one of my great mates, Alan Lamb, who was brilliant against the West Indies in the mid-80s, got hundreds against the West Indies, which very few batsmen playing for us or any nation did. Yeah. And yet, for instance, against, um, say, Australia, um, didn't quite put the same figures in. And yet you'd back him. If you, if you knew Lammy well, uh, you'd back him to make runs in those conditions because those were the sort of conditions that he normally liked. I mean, you yeah. have these sort of inexplicable things. Mm -hmm. um, but if, I suppose for Shea and for Craig Brathwaite, if you, um, you, know, you look back to that great partnership beforehand, that's what, says, that's what makes you say to yourself, right, let's, let's get stuck in and go and make some runs. Um, Zach, who are your, I mean, I know it's very early in your um, uh, international career, but what are, in amongst, say, the county sides, who do you like playing against? Who do you hate playing against? I've always enjoyed uh, playing against Warwickshire, actually. I'm not sure why. Um, mm -hmm. Well, usually, maybe because Edge Baston's a belting wicket usually, so that's probably a good reason why. Um, Somerset is a side I struggle with, and, and Essex, two of the sides who, who, are, who have been the two best sides since I've started playing county cricket. Um, but Warwick, Warwickshire seems to be in my side now, but thanks for jinxing me. I'm guaranteed a, a, to bag him next time against Warwickshire after <laughs> saying that. So uh, <laughs> It's always a good experience. Just get the pair yeah. out for you early. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Yeah, go on. Matt, obviously, you, you, just, you just finished this, this internal game. What are the, uh, how obviously the bowlers? If you get over there, you know obviously these bowlers like to get into the into the head, into your psyche. Do you have a little bit of bit of that contest? Yeah, co stuff going on there? Uh, definitely. We said at the start of the game, or um, Ben Stokes said at the start of the game, we wanted it to be really competitive. Uh, and it certainly was that. I mean, there was plenty, you know, plenty of bounces bowled. I can't think of many overs where they, they, were, they didn't use their two bounces for the over, um, which is always good practice. And then, you know, and then there was always, there was actually, it was a bit of chirp flying around in some places, you know, how Jimmy gets when he gets a couple of fours hit off him or something like that. So, um, no, it was really, it was really good fun. And to see the competitive nature come out, you could see, you could tell everyone had been cooped up indoors for a few months because um, they wanted to they wanted to let it fly a couple of times so it was, uh, no, it was, it was a very competitive match actually. And how did it go by the way Zach with all the new protocols about shining the ball not using um, saliva that sort of stuff? The shining the ball was easier than we thought actually because you're allowed to use a sweat um, yeah. and it was it was quite it was decent temperature the last couple of days um, so we, there was a few of us sweating a bit so Basically, whoever was sweating the most, we just threw the ball to him and um, got him to shine it, and uh, and it, it, was, it was absolutely fine. So, um, so yeah, that shouldn't be a problem really. I, I'd expect to see just the same amount of swing, maybe not quite the same as but maybe putting slider on where you can get quite quite a good shine on it. But um, you know, yeah. it wasn't like we couldn't shine the ball. Indeed. Um, now, um, would you prefer the use of artificial noise in the ground? What, what are your thoughts on the? Um, on the atmosphere or lack of? I think so. I think it would be, it's definitely worth a try on the first test and see how it goes. Um, 
it's, it's a credible atmosphere. It seems to work quite well in the football. Um, so we, we played without it um, in this game, and um, well, so I can't comment. To, I can say that it worked fine without it, but I mean, it's, it's definitely worth a shot with it, just in case it does create a good atmosphere for the people on TV. You can, you know, you don't hear silence when the bowlers walking back to their mark. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think it's definitely worth a try. Uh, well, as I said, we, we need to get the Black Opal um, uh, pop-up dummies. That's me and Gladstone, of course. Um, with the shirts on all around the ground. So every time there's a, a boundary or a six or a 50 or a hundred, up come these figures, uh, applauding nicely. And you know, hopefully it'll be Zach Crawley raising money for the Lord's Taverners. Um, got a question here from Rowan Hander, who is 12 years old and from Hartley Wintley Cricket Club. I know it well, or well enough. Um, his question is, this, going to uh, going to be great to see England taken away now is, Who's the best test all-rounder, Jason Holder or Ben Stokes? Uh, Simo, you can start with that one. Um. (laughs) (laughs) I can't put the tester for you. Uh, I think at the end of the series, we'll answer that. I think the series will decide who's the better all-rounder. Well, of course, in this first test match, I know you're smiling away. I've seen that smile for so many years now. Uh, Simi, I know you're smiling away and so kind of dodging a slight bullet here. You've got to support your captain, I know. Um, But you've actually got the two all-rounders, two big all-rounders, both captaining their teams in this first test match. Um, Just actually, on a serious note, just tell us how Jason has coped, because he's such an impressive, impressive character as a leader as well as a cricketer that he seems to have just... Um, and how many years now has he, has he been captain? Three or four now. He's, you know, he's really, really taken on the role. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's something that that he relishes. It's something that he enjoys. And I think that being number one all rounder uh, and, and in Test cricket, I think he enjoys being up there. So I think he's going to be given everything at the end of the day to be to remain at the top at the end of the series. But as I said in an interview a few weeks ago, this is going to be a big part of the series. Um, who, which of these two all rounders um, give more to their side? Which of these two all rounders perform better on 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 the, in the test matches? So I think it's going to be very competitive between the two of them. All right, Zach. Um, how was how has Ben over the last few days in his new and admittedly temporary role as England's captain? He was very good. It seemed like um, you know he's very comfortable with the job. Mm-hmm. Um, he was, you know, he he's played a lot of cricket now. He, he's more than capable of uh, captain in England for sure, and uh, and he's one of those people who leads from the front in the field. Uh, well, in in all three facets of the game. So um, no, I mean, it, it, he's definitely the right man for the job while um, while Joe's away, and he he seemed to fit into the role very well. Good. So, well, all being well, you'll enjoy playing on starting next week. Gladys, we need to get we need to get an answer. We need to get a a neutral opinion as to who is the best all rounder of these two men, Jason Holder or Ben Stokes. They're, they're two very talented cricketers, but different. They're both different. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's that Ben, but there's that Stokesy. Um, he he seems to be able to play. He play. He, he can play the play the defensive role. Then he goes through the gears and to be more to be very very explosive. Jason, Jason is, is battle and fought manfully, very on um, numerous occasions. Mm. Probably my liking, but he comes in number seven, number eight, and he and he's and oh, and he's repeatedly, you know, you know, you know rescued the innings for, for, the, for the team. You know, so he so he shows that he's got a really strong mm. character with, 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 with the bat as well. Two very talented cricketers. So with the ball, Stokesy probably has the edge, definitely has the edge with pace. You know? and, and Stokesy at times he's he he gets thrown the ball to be the enforcer and the and the inspir and, and the inspirator for the England team. Uh, you know, I was watching a couple of test matches with the Cape Town test match that we watched um, with, earlier this year when the game was going pretty much nowhere. The pitch seemed to be flattened out and. And Stokes, he put, put ball a spell of about a dozen 13 overs, and he, he just mm. seemed to get quicker and quicker. And in the end, I think Zach took a took a, a screamer of a catch. And I don't, I don't think you saw that one coming at you when you plucked it out of the air at third slip or so. And, and that's so Stokes, he probably have that 
edge of the pace. But then again, Jason, when and he'll enjoy bowling in these English conditions. He, he, he moves, he, he just nibbles and wobbles the ball, either a little bit of the out away swing from right handed batsman. So he's quite mm -hmm. accurate. You know, got that little bit of height, which gives him that little bit of bounce. So he'll be very useful in our conditions in these in these test match series. Mm -hmm. So two very, very talented cricketers. Um, who who would I like to I'm I'm happy that stops. Ben Stokes is playing for England. Uh, so am I. Um, I mean, let us not forget, um, because there are, when you get, a, get to this stage just before a test series starting, I mean, we tend to think, yes, that home advantage has some play, yep. Um, but the West Indies, as we said just now, came back and won that head in the test match last time around. We went to the Caribbean last time and were expected to win. I say we, England went to the Caribbean to win. And the man we're talking about, Jason Holder, had one of those stunning all-round performances, double hundred, whatever it was, uh, and lo and behold, they win the Test match in Barbados. Mm. Read the English papers, but Simo was definitely meant to happen. If you were representing the Caribbean the West, with the West Indies, yeah, it was it was meant to happen. And and the the thing about that series is that um, I don't I don't think they were coming from as good a place as they ended up on. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a lot going on in the Caribbean at that time, but them winning that series really lifted everyone. And and it's a case where his performances and he seems to he seems to like it against England because even in Antigua that time he scored his hundred in the Test match when when I was there a few years ago. So he seems to like playing against England, which is one good thing for us on this tour. Okay, I've got a few other questions that were sent in before our little webinar here. Um, I can't do them all, sadly, but there's one here from Chris Coke, um, which is on the same topic. When you've picked your in, when England has picked uh, you know, their finest player, i.e. the likes of Botham, Flintoff, Peterson, um, they've not necessarily succeeded as Test match captains. Um, so he's worried about Ben Stokes' form suffering. Therefore, is it a good idea to have him as captain? We've answered that earlier with Mike Atherton. But will the West Indies target him? Is that similar? Is that part of your plan? I think the pl the plan right now is to target everyone. <laughs> I think good answer. You've got to get to you've got to get to Ben before you can target him. Yep. So yep. our 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 plan is that we take everyone and we target everyone. You know, you've got to you've got to get down to him before we can get him out. So if we keep thinking about him, um, Zach and the others at the top, we're gonna forget about them, and we don't want to do that. No, I don't think he minds being targeted anyways. So it's, it's actually one of those things, I know that it, historically, um, I mean, again, going back to my sort of era, West Indies, uh, with the great fast bowlers of that era, with the great fast bowlers that followed, uh, with Ambrose, Walsh, these guys, would often target the captain, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but as you say, they'd also target, um, for instance, the likes of someone like Graham Hick, who came yeah. into the side against Ambrose and Walsh, yeah. with an extraordinary reputation behind him. Mm -hmm. um, Playing his first, I, I don't envy him playing his first test match against them course, in those circumstances at all. But you know, he was targeted. Yeah, and I, th I think every, everybody, I think Mike, if he was still here, he would, he mm -hmm. would know that at times he was targeted. Georgie, yeah, Robin Smith, you know, um, every, everybody who at that stage were, were doing well. But mm -hmm. at the same time, we know where we always had to get to them. So how we started, like we get through the first two batsmen, then you start getting to the players that, you know, you're thinking about. So get to Stokes, Stokesy, we've got to get four wickets. Yeah, indeed. And you've got to get Zach Crawley out as well. well that's part of the four. <laughs> um, Zach, got a question here from David Whittingham um, about really sort of coping with COVID, about the... The problems of the last three or four months being isolated, locked down, unable to do the things you'd normally be doing. Um, just to, again, I know we talked about it a few weeks ago when we first started these webinars, but how's it been and how do you feel now about it? You know, it's obviously been frustrating. I mean, you know, called home from a test tour, you know, for your country is, was very frustrating at the time, but it was, it was certainly the right call. Uh, and obviously to miss half the half the season was was again frustrating. But now that we're getting some cricket in, um, you kind of forget about that and, and look to the future. And now it's very exciting. Um, 
it's been. It, I mean, I'm not going to say it was good because obviously it was, it was a bad situation in, in many ways. But um, it was quite good for me in one way that where I could um, get my fitness up. Where you know I felt like I was in decent shape. But anyway, but usually during we play so much cricket during the summers that you know it's usually you go batting practice and training and that, and you don't usually have much time for fitness. So I feel like you know I'm in the, in the best shape of my life physically because mm-hmm. there wasn't a lot else to do during the lockdown. So uh, I did a lot of training. Uh, and now I feel like I can, you know, concentrate fully on the cricket for a while without losing too much on the fitness side, which is good. But other than that, there weren't too many positives to take from it. I would, I would much rather um, have been, you know, a full, full English summer of cricket and, and that Sri Lanka tour, indeed, that's for sure. Um, Phil, one for you here from a fellow called Craig Lavelle, um, who says, would you ever consider coaching England men's cricket in the future? Yeah, let me let me finish with this job first, and then <laughs> and then we can think about that. But I mean, you would love to you would love to coach any other big teams and any any other teams in the top half of the um of the ICC ranking. So I never say no to that after I finish with West Indies. Mm. Uh, quite right too. You you sort out this job first, sort this one out first. <laughs> exactly. You, if you if you win this series, the world's your lobster, as they say. In... <laughs> Uh, wherever they say that. Um, Akish Kokar has also put us a few questions. Actually, she's put far too many questions, to be honest. There's four here. I'm going to pick one. Um, it's still kind of COVID-related, but could be also a very general question. He says, as question three out of four here, should Test Match Cricket now be played over four days to reduce the risk of COVID and exposure to players? Um, my guess about that is I don't think it makes any difference if you played it over 10 minutes or five days. The risk is probably, probably pretty much the same in terms of COVID being around us. But four days in general, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things that over the last couple of years has been talked about by administrators. Uh, so with or without COVID, what about four-day test matches? So Zach, start with you on that one. I, I disagree with four-day test matches personally. Mm. I feel like um, five-day cricket is how it's always been and you still get those best games when, it, when it's five days. I feel like the game might be slightly rushed um, if it was a four-day game. You know, you, you wouldn't get people batting long into the, into the second day. Um, and so, well, you wouldn't have had Brian Lara at 4.01 yeah. for starters, probably. So, um, but no, I, you know, I'm, I'm a traditionalist and it stays for five days for I me. I love it. I love it. Simo, um, obviously, when I was captaining England in the West Indies in the 80s, we went back to the old system with three day games, <laughs> um, but somewhat inadvertently. Um, for you, where do, where do you stand on this? I, I am totally with Zach on this. I, I am. Yeah. I love the three formats of the game. Don't get me wrong, but I think Test cricket needs to stay at five days. And I, I think that the beauty about Test cricket is that every day is a different day, and every day can be it can be a one day game, you know. So mm. I think it needs to stay at five days. Um, I'm not one for four days. Well, I think we're we're pretty much in agreement, Gladys. Uh, listen, uh, you can, we, we, and we've seen over the years, you have some exceptional, the times when it get down to the fifth day of a test match, it's nerve wracking, we, we, here we get, we get full house crowds even for fifth day of a test match. And yeah. it's, only sometimes, it's only because you have five days that a lot of the games actually finish in, finish in four. Um, that, 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 that makes, makes cricket in sense, that, 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 that sort of analogy does. Yeah. But no, five days, to, it, it's, it's what makes the test cricket, the, 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 mental, the, the mental game and the, that it is for players and, and spectators. And, it, and, and hopefully that, that remains that, that the status quo for, for, that, for the international Okay, cricket. that's motion passed, I think, uh, unanimously all round there. Uh, before we go, uh, obviously time is probably, well, it is against us now. Um, a couple here for Phil. Uh, fresh questions coming up. One from Andrew Haynes, as he says, not a question, but please ask Phil to pass on the thanks to the cricket-loving public to the West Indies team for helping to get the great game back on, which is a very good point, actually. Without West Indies agreeing to tour here, um, we wouldn't be having this conversation now. So thank you from all of us. I will extend, I will extend that to the team. Indeed, please do. And there's another one here, um, actually from Nick Lindsay for Phil saying, Phil looks well wrapped up. Is he enjoying the wonderful English summer? <laughs> it's nice and warm. Okay, I'll just show you something again, just to remind you, just in case you weren't here earlier on this webinar. Um, yes, there's Hampshire for you. <laughs> all sunny and nice. 
There's Hampshire and his, hang on, hold on, oh, no, no, whoa, 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 and his, where we'd like to be. Well, yeah, we'll get back there next month. <laughs> hey, hey, Zach, would you be, are you able to give Phil any tips about the, the, the golf course? I'm sure the England boys have been playing the golf course next to the JS Bowl ground the last few days. Simo, he, he likes he likes his round Yeah, just to keep an eye on it, keep it in play on the tee and you'll be fine around there. You'll burn it up. Yeah, well, that's me. I don't have drivers in my bag. I'm not like Smalley. <laughs> you, you hit it far enough for an hour and I promise you. Hang on. <laughs> Bill Simmons, Bill Simmons, I cannot believe that you don't like the challenge of hitting a driver as far as the pros. I like the challenge, but when I'm playing a bit more often, I get it straight. It's not a challenge when it goes five miles through point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but you, you, you st probably still on a fairway. Well. <laughs> All right, uh, there's, there's another one here for Glad as well. Um, can you ask Glad if he was a betting man? Glad, are you a betting man? Well, actually, uh, okay, right. Not... Anyway, we're not, this is not about the derby. It's would you put your money on England winning the Test series or Villa? Avoiding relegation. Okay. That's a difficult one, Gladdy. I know, I know which one's favourite, and it's not the cricket. It's not the cricket <laughs> option. Sadly, sadly, my my Villa boys are looking. The, the trap door is sort of getting a bit more jar. Indeed. All right. Well, um, gentlemen, time is pretty much up there. Um, thank you all for being part of this uh, tonight. As ever, we've got a. A nice following online. Um, as ever, we're very grateful to Black Opal for putting us up there for us. Um, also great for the Lord's Taverners, we're part of, who are part of this. So nice to welcome Zach to the, the fold of the Lord's Taverners. I can tell you that Lord's Taverners have a very good track record of getting people young and keeping them forever. So if you're now in 40 years time, you'll probably be president of the Lord's Taverners. <laughs> But uh, more important, more important than that. So good luck with the obviously with the fundraising for them as part of your job as an English reader. Um, we wish both of you well, Zach, um, Phil. Um, we're very much looking forward to Test cricket being on our screens in six days' time. So let's hope there's nothing gets in the way of that between now and then. Uh, we wish you both well. We want a great series, want a fantastic series, want a competitive series, and I know both of you will be keen to see that happen. So many thanks from all of us, Gladys again. Lovely to have you with us as ever. And before we go, Phil, quick glass of rum just to toast you all and thank you for coming. Gentlemen, thanks very much. <laughs> uh, you'll be good. You'll be good. <laughs>